Stats show that men do not take their health as seriously as women. But with heart disease and cancer as the number one and two killers of men, anxiety and depression on the rise, should they wake up and pay attention? That's right. It's all about men's health today on Healthy Harmony. Welcome to Healthy Harmony, where we help you clarify and discuss health tactics to harmonize your life. I am your host and health coach, Jennifer Pickett, and today my guest is Dr. Corey Rice. For all of you Baylor fans, Dr. Rice graduated from Baylor University and then went on to pursue medicine at the Arizona College of Osteopathic Medicine, completing his internship and residency at Methodist Medical Center of Dallas. He was chosen as chief resident during his final year. After spending some time in internal medicine and identifying a profound need for a more directed focus on prevention and wellness, he opened a private practice that specializes in functional and lifestyle medicine. Dr. Rice specializes in bioidentical hormone replacement and nutrition-based chronic disease management. Receiving several awards and recognitions for his tremendous work, he has become a very popular guest speaker and can often be seen on local Dallas TV and heard on local and national radio. Dr. Rice, thank you so much for joining us. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. I can't, I'm, I'm super excited to be here. So glad you're here. So I made a little bit of an inflammatory statement at the beginning when I said that there's a tendency for men to not take their health as seriously as women. What do you think about that statement? 100% accurate. So um, I am a man, so I treat a lot of them, but but I also treat a lot of um, their significant others. And so I can tell you, uh, we like to kind of joke, but it's serious that that women are fun to treat because they sort of tell you everything. Um, women and, and men, you know, on the flip side of that, sometimes don't tell you much. And so, you know, we have to do sophisticated testing to prove to them that they may not actually be optimized or healthy. Okay, so you kind of have to get in their face a little bit and prove it to them that, hey, this is something you need to to look at. This is something you need to, to pay attention to. So what would some of those tests or what would that look like? What would that be for you to kind of prove to them, hey, this is something you need to take seriously? Well, I think first and foremost, before you get into testing, it's it's just taking a good thorough history and letting, you know, the patient know that you're 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 also a patient, right? We're all our own patient. And and yes. just kind of getting to that cerebral level with a man and letting them know that, you know, there's a new sense of normalcy that I think a lot of uh patients just sort of get stuck in. They get into a rut where they just feel like how they feel and how they are is normal. They surround themselves with pem- people similar to them and they all just sort of think that how they feel and how they perform is just normal and that aging is just one of those definite things that is going to call, cause things to just potentially not work as well as they did before. And so I think, you know, just laying the groundwork with that reality that, that you know, as we age, we do become risk, you know, we have certain elevated risk for certain issues and our quality of life may go down. And so, you know, just, just aligning expectations to understand that you don't have to live that way, you don't have to feel that way, you don't have to be that way. There are safe ways to to test and figure out from food to stress to sleep to how you supplement to how you exercise to how you you know look at your hormones all of these things when you when you layer all of that in to a to a man's health or or a female's health um, all of that really goes into account so that really it doesn't matter if you're 30 60 or 90 you can still feel like you did when you were at your your most optimal state, which which typically in men is right around 30 and in women is usually in their mid to sort of low 20s. So that's really that's what interesting. To do. I, I think you made such a, a an interesting statement when you said that we've come to accept so much of this as a normal part of aging. And I think sometimes we kind of settle into this complacency of, hey, this is just part of it. We kind of get we, we start to accept sick and tired as our norm like, and, and don't even realize how good our bodies can feel. So as you've worked with men uh, over the years, 
what do you think men are most concerned about when it comes to their health? As you uh, help them identify some things and you're taking that deep dive, really getting to the root of the issue, what do you think, uh, what are those common themes that's coming out that men are saying, hey, okay, now that you've pointed this out, this is what I'm most concerned about, or this is what I struggle with the most? Sure. So I'd like to tell you that every man comes in and says, you know, I don't want to get heart disease. I don't want to have strokes. I don't want to get Alzheimer's dementia and I don't want to have cancer. That is not the reality. Most men that I see don't even really speak in those terms. It's a little more uh, high level or a little more elevated than that. It's sort of the forest of things. I want better performance. I want better strength. I want more better sexual drive. I want more muscle tone. This beer gut or this this lower abdominal fat layer, I want to get rid of that. I just want better energy. I feel like I'm cranky. I feel like I'm I'm just I'm short of short fused. And I just have this brain fog about me that I'm just my mental acuity is not what it once was. I can't perform as well either at home or at work. That's really what they're saying. So we don't even really get into the disease process as much as I'd like to. It's more about how do I improve your performance in every facet of your life? So most guys that I see, it usually centers right around that when we start off. That performance-driven mentality, which I think is very interesting uh, because you've taken that insight that you've had and you're listening uh, to your patients and you're putting it in terms that uh, they're going to relate to um, where and they identify with, you know, the lack of energy and um, they just want to get better performance and feel stronger and lose that belly. Um, so I love how you've kind of uh, allowed the disease state to take a back seat because that's not what you're hearing from them. They simply want to level up, right? They're ready to perform better than the guy next to them. Um, do, do you think, do you see kind of some of that competitive nature coming out? Is that how you're commu- communicating with your men to kind of give them a little bit of a, a motivation factor there? Yeah, you took the words out of my mouth. So, you know, I think men by nature, this isn't really stereotyping. It's just what I see and in, in generalizing, we're just competitive. Um, and you know, as I said, I am a man. And, and when I sit across from someone who's, who's, they don't have to be my age, but a lot of them want to know my story too. Um, I live and breathe, eat and drink a a pretty healthy lifestyle. And I think I come across that way when I'm talking to a patient. And so oftentimes they want to know what, what do I do or or how, you know, what, what did I do to get to sort of where I am both in a performance space and from a laboratory space and all of that. And so, and I think that's coming from a very genuine place, but at the end of the day, there's also a, some sort of a, a competitive edge to there that they want to know what can they do to kind of perform optimally as well. So, yeah, I mean, I think men by nature are just just somewhat wired to be competitive and there's nothing wrong with being competitive. I think it's healthy Not to have a competitive edge, um, but it can obviously be flipped into a pathologic state where it is very unhealthy for them to be competitive. But when it comes to their health, I would challenge every man to be competitive about their health. I like that. I really like that. Now. Obviously, you take a very unique approach here. I used um, a term in your bio, and and I, and I realize that there's a lot of folks who don't know what this term is, and that term is functional medicine. So I know you were in internal medicine. Um, tell me, like, what kind of brought about the shift for you to go into private practice and get more into this functional medicine and lifestyle yeah. medicine? So internal medicine, I imagine the listener has a conceptual idea of what that is. It's essentially you know, a primary care doctor that's trained in advanced stage uh, disease. So if your kidney falls apart, liver falls apart, heart falls apart, body falls apart, an internist is someone who conventionally can try to keep your body together with medications, potentially surgical interventions, as long as possible. Functional medicine is an entirely different paradigm. It's, it's looking at why you have potentially what you have. So the traditional physician is trained to diagnose and to treat, you know, whatever that diagnosis is. A functional medicine doctor concentrates on the why of what the patient has. So they're trying to give them answers as to what got them into this cancer diagnosis, this diabetic diagnosis, this autoimmune diagnosis. So it's really giving them the why to the whole story of where they are today. And so 
I don't know how, how much time we have here, but as far as my anecdotal story as to what got us to where we are now and really what got me to where is now is yeah. we all have our own story. And so I'll, I'll bore the audience for a minute, but essentially what got me into what we now practice was my own health. So I would say seven, eight years ago, as I said, I was a traditional internist and I was essentially treating myself. I was on at least five or six prescription medicines. Um, some, yeah, oh, some for cholesterol, um, you know, blood pressure, uh, allergies, these sort of things. And I was just doing what you normally would do. I worked out five days a week. I generally ate what I thought was healthy, but I was not very educated on either exercise nor nutrient dense eating. So I just sort of was living life and then ended up on these medications. And so I wasn't feeling great. Um, I was in my early 30s, late 20s, and I did some cursory labs and noticed that I had some problems. I was developing at high insulin level, which is essentially putting you on the fast track to getting pre-diabetes and then into full diabetes, full blown diabetes. And when you combine that cardiometabolic mess that I was in from blood pressure to lipids to insulin and blood sugars and all of that stuff, it leads to, well, a belly. And when you have a belly, you know, you have more fat than you have muscle. And it's this whole cascade of problems that leads to you being fatigued, not sleeping well, having a bad brain, all of these. things. So I was sort of in that world. And when I realized this about myself, I couldn't, that's just not how I wanted to live. And so once I figured out how I, at that time, should be eating um, and, and treating my body, I changed things dramatically um, in my own life from, a, from how I was eating to how I started to eat, um, how I actually. So let me ask you a question really quick. Did you receive, what kind of nutrition education did you receive uh, when you were in medical school? Uh, zero. So yeah, medical school oh, residency wow. doesn't do any, you learn biochemistry and you learn, you know, pathways and processes throughout the body and enzymes and all these kind of things. But you don't really, you're not really taught how food, the very raw products that feed those processes and, and, and feed the, the pathways you're not really taught how food interacts with that. You're really taught how drugs um, block, mask, or otherwise confuse the, own the, the body's natural system on how it should respond. So nutrition is just not part of our formal uh, didactic going through, you know, goodness. Yeah. yeah, very yeah. interesting. So with that said, yeah, so what we did and what I did essentially, once I changed some of my habits, um, I... I guess about six months later, ran some of those same tests. I felt great, but ran some of those same tests and I had ended up flipping some of my markers and getting better and ultimately got off of medication. I mean, within six to eight months, I was medication free and, and really didn't have any allergies left. Um, and so I just couldn't believe it. And so I kind of was struck by this and I talked to um, what I would consider probably my mentor back then, someone who I trusted, and um, they recommended that I go through uh, applying functional medicine to clinical practice, which is a, a seven day rigorous course through the Institute of Functional Medicine. Um, and I went to this, this course and was blown away at, at what these doctors were doing for disease and how they were fixing these diseases. And the word, the four letter C word we never talk about is cure, but they were talking about curing and they were talking about remission and they were talking about gone. Right. And Incredible. so that, that when we left that course, we could not come back and practice this hypocrisy of what we've been doing the previous few years. So we sort of parlayed all of that into what we do now. So, you know, if you have specific questions, I'll be happy to answer those, but there, that story could keep going on. And on. <laughs> That's an, uh, and I, well, I do wish we had more time, but I'm glad you gave us that, that highlight of what drove you to functional medicine. And um, I want to make sure the listeners understand that this is a truly unique approach that is not a Band-Aid solution. It's truly getting to the root of the issue. It's addressing the why. Why is this happening? Why is someone struggling with weight gain, for instance? Why are they struggling with anxiety and depression? As we talk about men's health, um, what is, earlier you referenced hormones. So I want us to, with the remaining time we have left, I really want us to unpack that because I know that that is uh, a huge topic that uh, is widely discussed. So when we say hormones and men, what's the most important thing for men to know? Most important thing is that hormone hormones are not just a female thing. 
hormones are in all of us. Um, we have receptors throughout our body that respond to hormones. We make our own hormones. And as we age, we start losing those hormones. But nothing's created equal when it comes to that. So hormones themselves, there's synthetic hormones. And then there's what's called human identical or bioidentical or natural hormones. And so it becomes important for the listener to understand that from the soil that we grow our food from, to the food we then make from that soil, to the supplements we then supplement with from that food or from that soil, all of that, we live in a very toxic sort of polluted planet. So when you live in this toxic place, when the soil's sick, the food's sick, the people are sick, when all of that stuff's sick, it causes your hormones to do things they weren't intended to do. And oftentimes you lose those hormones quickly because we are in this sort of pro-inflammatory environment that we've been thrust into. And so when you lose hormones or your hormones act in a different way than they were intended to act, that is when you get disease. That's when you get these pathological concerns that can be unraveled, not always through balancing of those hormones, even though that is a big part of it, but actually just cleaning up the environment that you live in from a food, water, air, stress, sleep perspective. You clean those things up, you will notice that your hormones actually respond the way they were intended to. Now, if biologically you're just aging and her ovaries or his testes are not producing hormones the way that they should, or as much as we'd like, then we can sort of enter the discussion of potentially replacing them. But what the listener has to understand is that this isn't a disease or a, a state of old age. This is something that's happening very, very young. I mean, we're seeing fertility problems very young now. We're seeing men yes. with low sperm counts and low testosterone values in their 20s. I mean, this is unheard of. And so it's a, it's a global problem. This isn't just unique. And so it's just just for the listener to understand, it's not uncommon. It's, it's not a rare thing. This is a very common thing to see just the average person have problems with their hormones. It's just it's just what we see. So you identified some things that really contribute to this overall toxic state of our body and how our body is uh, just not working efficiently. So you brought up some things that I think often get missed as we uh, as we look at our overall health journey. You brought up stress management, you brought up sleep, you brought up cleaning up the foods that you eat, the water that you're drinking, what you're consuming, everything we're taking in. So um, how would you advise a man to, to start when it comes to that lifestyle change? What is the most simple first step in cleaning up what they're putting in? Yeah. So I think what I would you know, you'll learn if you talk to me more that nothing's ever easy with me and, and how I respond. To it. And so mm -hmm. and so you'll see that throughout this, part, this podcast. But I don't think indiscriminately there's one diet, supplement or hormone that can be used for every individual. I think we're all individual, unique creatures that need to be having physicians and offices that focused on on precision, personalized medicine. So with that said, there are ways, I don't think there's one food plan, menu plan, or nutrient-dense you know, menu out there that I would recommend for everyone. But with that said, I think the body, it's like when we learn about muscle confusion, right, in the gym. and We don't want to just repetitively do the same thing over. We want to confuse our body so that, it, it, so that it, it's sort of um, building different muscles and, and staying ahead of it instead of just getting kind of robotic with what we do. I think it's the same thing with food. I think when you look at food and how you eat it, you want to kind of go back and forth. But at the end of the day, when you cut flesh all that out, it's still left with one certainty. You want to eat real, actual food, not these sort of Franken foods or these you know, food like yeah. substances, right? You want to eat real, actual food. So, and then things that are in that food, so preservatives, artificial this, artificial that, all the things that our body was not intended to intake, anyways, if you can just clean up and get rid of some of that artificial preservative and start with real food, it's a great start. Now, we can start divvying up some of the macronutrients, protein, carbs, and fats, and all that. And there's different, quote, diets out there to do that. But at the end of the day, if a patient can just eat real, actual, sustainable food and not this, as I said, food-like substance, that's important. Now, how do you get that education? Yeah, a doctor can do it. But really, what's more important is you have to have someone qualified, in my opinion, 
in your office or in that medical practice that is trained and is living the life of of how food works and how how food matters to our body. And sometimes doctors don't have time for that. So we have health coaches that are amazing people that focus solely on that so that patients understand how to do some of the things that we, we talk about in the room. I love how simply you put that. Um, and I could not agree with you more. Just that approach to real, actual food, those real whole foods, those foods that you can easily identify and trying to weed out some of the junk that is just full of all of the artificial chemicals that have our bodies in a complete toxic state. Um, And kind of a shout out to your office. You do. uh, I have been in your office being a health coach and dietitian myself. I knew that, hey, I need to have my own health coach. So I've been very pleased with the health coaches uh, and uh, both you and Dr. V in your office. Um, Just excellent what you're doing, because it's very, very empowering is what I have found. Just very, very empowering. So I want to encourage our listeners to really look into functional medicine and allowing someone to help you take a very personalized approach because there is no one size fits all. So Dr. Rice, uh, we have just a few more minutes and I want to address probably one of the most controversial topics that we'll be discussing today. And that is testosterone and uh, hormone replacement. Um, You are clearly very well versed in bioidentical hormone replacement. That is one of your specialties. And I think there's a lot of confusing information out there. There's these testosterone places popping up on every single corner. What do people need to know about about bioidentical hormones versus some of these other things that are out there? Right. So I think the truth is in the middle in some of these things, right? So it is true that in the history of hormone replacement therapy, the wrong doctor has given the wrong patient the wrong molecule of testosterone at the wrong time in their life. And guess what happened? They got the wrong result. Okay. So that is important. There are things you have to watch out for. But if you have the right molecule in the right patient by the right doctor (laughs) at the right time in their life, you get the right results. So what does that mean? So as we age, we know as a man at the age of 30, I don't care if you're the starting quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys or you play in the MLB or NBA or whatever it is you do. If you're a man at the age of 30, you will be losing that sex hormone about 1% to 3% every year after the age of 30. So you're going oh, wow. to be losing your ability to make that hormone. Well, ironically, what happens as we age? Well, age-related disease creeps on board. And one of the big ones, the big, 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 big ones that I would say that I focus on big time, One, Alzheimer's dementia. Why? There's no cure for it. The actual only pharmacologic intervention that's ever been shown to decrease your incidence of Alzheimer's dementia, depending on the study you look at, up to 50%, is hormones, period. And specifically estrogen. But believe it or not, men need estrogen. I don't want to get off that topic yet. So dementia is a big one. If we get testosterone in men and women, honestly, but in men on board early enough, their risk of Alzheimer's dementia goes down exponentially. Number two, heart disease, right? You said it at the outset of the show, number mm-hmm. one killer of men and women right now. If yes. we can get testosterone, the right molecule on board, then we will lower the risk of heart disease. We know that. There were studies done that said recently in the last three or four years that if you give a man testosterone, you're going to increase his risk for heart disease. We don't have the time to dissect those studies, but I would encourage the listener, if they're able to do it, read the details in that study because they were very mm-hmm. clear. <laughs> on what they actually found versus what they reported. Number three is cancer. Men that get prostate cancer in this country, statistically speaking across the board, have a low testosterone. And we will define that as great as less than 500. Aggressive prostate cancer happens when you have low testosterone. So we, Very have, interesting. we are massive advocates of at least getting the levels checked and then getting yourself in front of someone who's at least educated on the research around this stuff so that we can help prevent not just quality of life. That's a whole subset of patients. I mean, they come in wanting a better quality of life, but as a physician or, or a physician group, we really need to be reversing this sort of tide of chronic disease. And those are the big drivers that we're trying to reverse through hormone optimization. The numbers are simply staggering of how these diseases are just, um, have dramatically increased over the years. 
But for our for our men who are like, okay, look, I, yes, you're right. I don't want to get dementia. I don't want to get Alzheimer's. I know I need to do something. What are some of those, I, I like to call them side benefits, that are going to happen as they uh, receive, as their levels are checked, they receive the, the right amount, the right molecule by the right physician. Um, what are some of those side benefits that they will experience uh, immediately? Yeah, so one common misconception is testosterone is going to cause you to be aggressive or testosterone is going to cause you to be angry or, or sort of rage. And nothing could be further from that truth. So men that have low testosterone are moody, short fused, cranky. They're just not very fun to be around. When you optimize their testosterone, now again, according to the research, I run levels and we run levels between about 900 and 1100. You can keep your testosterone, total testosterone as a man there, it mellows you out. It calms you down. So one thing is it's a calming effect. The other thing it does is it gives you a better sense of mental acuity. So your fogginess, your cloudiness, your mental preparedness is much much better. I'm fortunate enough to take care of a lot of business owners and executives that are just sort of high stress, high strung people that need to perform on their job. Across the board, statistically, when you optimize that hormone, they tell you, my God, my performance at work is way better. And that's what men are interested in. I'm like, how can I level up? How can I have better performance than the dude next to me? Right. I mean, so I think that's such an incredible uh, benefit. Any other side benefits that they would experience? Yeah, so so from brain to energy to improving fat to lean mass ratio, right? No man wants to be fluffy and doughy. So it helps to remove some of that fluff and give them back some of that muscular firmness that they had when they were younger. Obviously, sexually, it will help with their desires. It will help with their want to. And then that parlays into helping with their performance, right? So potentially having a better erection or at least being able to last a little bit longer when they are intimate. Now, between the lean mass benefits to the brain, to the energy, to the sexual benefits, those are the biggest ones that I think that we see when you're when you're optimizing these guys. Incredible. I think I could feel every wife lean in a little bit as they're listening to this and listening to these benefits, because obviously, as wives, we want our men to be healthy. So uh, clear up one more thing for me before we wrap this up. Uh, bioidentical hormone replacement. Can you give me a really good definition and just a little short education on that? Of course. So bioidentical, break up the word bio. Bio means plant, life. It's plant-based life. So plant-based, identical is identical, same. So it's a plant-based molecule that's the same as he or she has been producing their entire natural life. How is that even possible that we can make that? Well, it's actually not that hard organically grown in the ground, you can extract from a yam a steroid ring. If we're going to create anything of nature, we need a ring, a steroid ring to manipulate the hydrogen, the carbon, all of the molecules. So we take from the ground a yam, we pull out a steroid ring. And what you do is you put that ring under the microscope right next to, in this case, a male molecule of testosterone. And you manipulate that steroid ring to be identical to that testosterone molecule from a man. Once that molecule is identical molecularly, when you're looking at it in the microscope, you then compound that molecule into something, a patch, a cream, a pellet, some form of delivery method for the patient. So when you have that, there is literally nothing in that other than pure testosterone. There's no yam, there's no soy, there's no filler, there's no binder, there's nothing. It's just pure hormone. So when you place that on or under or in the skin, the body responds to it in a way that it understands it because it reads that as something he's been making his whole adult life or our natural life. And that's the idea of what bioidentical is. So very fascinating. Thank you for breaking that down because I do think there's just a great deal of confusion out there. So uh, as we wrap this show up, what is your best piece of advice for a man who says, okay, dude, I know I need to do something, but I don't know where to start. So how would they go about finding a good physician to to take that closer look, that more in-depth look? Yep. So find a patient advocate, number one. So someone who advocates for you, not for something else. So if they advocate for you and they quantify those outcomes and they look at high level testing and they follow things for you. To prove to you it's getting better, you got to find that person. Well, how do you find that person? 
So I know that if you go to the Institute of Functional Medicine, ifm.org, they're going to have a smattering of physicians out there and, and providers that potentially could get you there. But as you said at the outset of this, the term functional medicine, in my opinion, is getting overused these days because there's functional medicine, there's different variants of that. Mm -hmm. And so you really have to find somebody you can partner with that you feel comfortable with that comes across at least as confident and competent about all of this stuff. That's kind of the, the complexity. Obviously, we have our office. We're just not everywhere for everyone. Yes. Fantastic advice. I think this has just been absolutely amazing today. Such a good discussion. And I hate to have to wrap it up because it's such a hot topic, but I think you did such an excellent job of just really showcasing um, how someone can get the help that they need so that they can have that better performance, that better drive. Um, so thank you so much for spending time with us today. Where can people find out more about you and your practice? Yeah, so we have a website, uh, www.mymodernmedicine.com. We have two locations in the Dallas area, uh, right there in Dallas proper in Addison, and then just off to the east, uh, south of Rockwall in Forney, Texas, mm -hmm. we have two locations. So that would be, uh, again, www.mymodernmedicine.com. Fantastic. Thank you so very much. Guys, also remember to subscribe to us on your favorite platform of choice. You can like us on Facebook or Instagram. Uh, and join in the discussion on our Facebook group. Also, you can tune in for updates at inspirehealthyharmony.com. So until we meet again, y'all have a great day.